watches are personal things. They stay with us for years, sometimes decades, and they can have a lot of value, even if they're not monetarily that uh, valuable, they can have a lot of uh, sentimental value. Even a $10 Casio? Yeah, even a $10 Casio. Maybe it's something you got from a parent that has uh, since passed away. Maybe it was an award you got for something. So even if a watch is in pretty bad condition, like uh, this one obviously is, uh, can be very valuable to uh, the owner. This is uh, Petar's watch. It was given to him by his grandfather as a sort of a coming-of-age gift when he was uh, turning a teenager. And uh, it still has beauty, for sure. But it's also clear that the years haven't been that uh, nice to this watch. It does show uh, quite a lot of wear. Gold plating has come off and so forth. It doesn't run, as we see. So we are going to spend this video trying to bring back a bit more of that beauty that uh, Peta remembers from uh, when he was a teenager. So we do that by first taking uh, the watch movement with the dial and the hands out of the case. By the way, these hands are definitely not the original ones. The second hand, yes, but uh, that hour hand looks like a psycho hand. And as you might have seen, the minute hand had already fallen off and was just lying on top of the dial. And that dial is beautiful. Yes, it is worn, but uh, the design and the color is just really nice, I think. If it's your first time to the channel, uh, welcome. Well, also welcome to uh, those who are returning uh, visitors, of course. My name is Stian. And yes, that is a weird ass name, but uh, that's the name I was given. And it's not such a weird name in Norway, where uh, I actually come from. But I do now live and work in Switzerland as an independent watchmaker, which is obviously a great place uh, for that kind of job. What makes a watch tick and talk is uh, called the movement. And uh, this is, uh, as you might already understand, a very simple movement. It doesn't have any kind of complications. It doesn't show uh, the date. It doesn't show the weekday. It doesn't have a chronograph, so a kind of stopwatch function. But it's also clear that it's been a really long time since this watch has been serviced. This here is the balance. That's kind of the beating heart of uh, the movement. And uh, you might uh, have seen that it was a little bit kind of stuck. There is no uh, fresh oil to uh, be seen anywhere. The movement is uh, not Swiss, as uh, is uh, most common with old watches like this. But I guess you can say it's almost Swiss. It's uh, a Lorsa movement. And uh, Lorsa resided in France, just uh, across the border from Geneva. You will find uh, Lorsa movements in uh, quite a few old watches. The brand is also not uh, Swiss, it's uh, an Italian brand from what I know, Aretta. It's also not a brand that exists anymore, as uh, so many brands uh, did succumb in uh, the 70s. And uh, from what I know from Petar, this uh, watch is from uh, the 50s. That is also something we can uh, discern from uh, the lack of uh, shock settings on uh, the balance. We'll get back to that uh, later when we do the assembly. So we've taken all the parts off the train side. The train side is where all the wheels and uh, pinions are. And we're now over on the dial side. The dial side is uh, quite obviously the side where the dial is. But it's also uh, where all the parts for setting and showing the time are. With all the parts taken off the main plate, we uh, can then clean these uh, jewel bearings a little bit with this uh, piece of pegwood. That is to take out any crusty or solidified old uh, lubrication. We're also going to take the mainspring out of the barrel. This is the barrel. And inside it we have the mainspring. 
The mainspring is the only source of power for a mechanical watch. And uh, you can see it's uh, coiled up uh, pretty neatly inside the, the barrel. So we're taking it out and then uh, we can uh, clean it and uh, reuse it. We're also going to clean the barrel a little bit with our pegwood stick. And this is just a pre-clean so that we don't contaminate the expensive chemicals in our cleaning machine too much. All right, with all the parts laid out, not too many of them, we can then put them in the basket and then let the cleaning machine do its magic. Black magic? No, I think it's pretty white, kind of bleached magic, I suppose. So with the witchcraft part being taken care of, uh, let's uh, turn our attention to the case. The case was gold plated at some point, but it's now very uh, worn, quite uh, dirty as well. So we're going to bring out our uh, pegwood once again. And for all the gunk fetishists out there, yes, I know you're out there. This is for you. What we call a crystal is actually made of plastic, also uh, known as uh, plexiglass or hesalite, but it's uh, just uh, sort of plastic. It is uh, very strong for sure, but as we see, it does get a lot of scratches, so uh, we are going to replace it. And we are going to add my wife's uh, compost garden with this. Must be something that will really enjoy growing in that. All right. Brace yourselves for the ultrasonic. Well, this is actually the part where you have to brace yourselves. Three, two, one. Ugh. So we got all the parts back from the cleaning machine and uh, we are going to start with uh, reassembling the barrel. Now, if you haven't watched a lot of uh, videos about watchmaking or watch repair, that kind of thing, then uh, this might be a surprise, but uh, watchmakers are tool junkies. Basically, anything we earn, any profit, just goes straight into another tool that we may use once upon a time in the future if all the stars align. That said, this one is actually a tool we use a lot. It's uh, a watch mainspring winder. It helps us uh, coil the mainspring up into uh, the barrel without uh, damaging it. So quite useful indeed. And then it's a fairly simple task of uh, just pressing uh, the mainspring back into the barrel. There is a little uh, edge that uh, the outer end of the mainspring presses against so that it doesn't uh, slip in the barrel. So we have to line it up a little bit, but uh, apart from that, it's uh, pretty straightforward. In the center of the mainspring, we put uh, the barrel arbor. That one is uh, connected to the crown through a series of uh, wheels and uh, pinions. So that when we turn the crown, we also turn that barrel arbor and hence uh, we wind the mainspring. 
a link to a video in the description that uh, goes uh, through the whole logic of uh, what is in more detail if you're uh, interested. All right, with the barrel uh, ready, we can uh, turn our attention to uh, the balance. Now, I mentioned that the balance is kind of the beating heart of the movement. It oscillates back and forth uh, pretty rapidly. Old watches like this one uh, typically have a beat rate of 18,000 beats per hour, which uh, translates to uh, two and a half rotations per second. And you can imagine that uh, with the only source of power being that uh, quite small spring inside the, the barrel, we need to make sure that there's as little friction as possible. Now the key way to avoid friction is by using uh, materials that are very hard and very polished, so that uh, there's very little friction. And the materials used are uh, polished uh, steel and uh, rubies synthetic rubies and to minimize friction even more we're going to put a tiny little drop of oil onto the ruby but to make it stay there we're using this thing called fixo drop and that uh, prevents uh, that little uh, drop of oil from uh, creeping i mentioned earlier that the watch is probably from uh, the 1950s and early 50s could even be the 40s and one reason why uh, I'm pretty confident about that is uh, this uh, lack of shock setting on the balance. The balance wheel, so that uh, golden wheel with the little screws around the rim, is uh, press fit onto a staff. And that staff has very, very thin pivots at each end. The reason they're thin is to minimize friction. But that also means that they're very fragile. And most watches from the 1950s on, and uh, some even earlier, will have shock protection to avoid those pivots breaking. Hi, Papa. Hello. Hello. What are you doing? Are you making a video? Yeah. Papa? Yeah. On YouTube, when you watch this video, it, are they going to hear what I'm saying right now? Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah, like this time. All right, let's see if the balance oscillates freely. Yeah, that looks all right. So we can proceed with uh, building the movement. There are many ways to skin a cat fish, but uh, I'm going to start with uh, putting in the power source, uh, so the main spring in the barrel. As I started this uh, whole video with uh, watches are very personal uh, things. You wear them more than basically anything else, perhaps apart from your wedding band if you're a married person. And part of what makes uh, mechanical watches so uh, fascinating is uh, that they are tiny little machines, little mechanical wonders. So here we see that we build the train of wheels so that they all connect to the barrel. And of course, when we then uh, rotate the barrel, all the wheels should rotate uh, with it. The barrel itself doesn't rotate very fast, something like three turns every 24 hours. But the way the wheel train is designed, the balance wheel will oscillate almost half a million times every day. That's a lot of oscillations. And that is for an old watch with a slow beat rate like this one. Modern watches will have more like seven, eight hundred thousand oscillations per day. So that uh, means uh, there's a really good opportunity for uh, wear to develop. And the best way to avoid uh, wear developing is to uh, have your watch uh, cleaned and uh, lubricated uh, like I'm doing here. And it is quite uh, astonishing that uh, this movement is in that good condition. 
it hasn't been maintained very well at all but I used it for uh, quite a few years and then of course uh, during the space age he got himself a quartz watch not a Casio I don't know the brand but uh, that uh, made him not wear this watch for a long time so it's been uh, stuck in the drawer for many many years until now so we see that uh, the train of wheels uh, is in place now we're putting on uh, the ratchet wheel and the crown wheel this will uh, help us wind the watch so we see that when we turn that ratchet wheel the whole uh, barrel turns and with it uh, the train same thing when we turn the crown wheel the crown wheel is the one that will directly mesh with uh, the winding stem all right we're back over on uh, the dial side what we're putting on here is the cannon pinion and that is uh, the part that allows us to uh, catch the power from uh, the train side and uh, use it on the dial side so ultimately we're going to put uh, the minute hand on that one we do need to put in uh, the parts for uh, doing the winding and setting of the watch it's called the keyless works because in the old days you needed a key for doing that so of course it's been 150 years since you needed that but uh, the name still remains so uh, you might see that I do have a crown now and a stem so yeah I did uh, buy a spare old movement that I'm also going to steal the hands from that also means that the hands will not be new which they shouldn't be given that uh, the rest of the watch is not new but we'll uh, get to that later you might also see that I'm using uh, a few different uh, types of lubricants we had this beautiful uh, blue one and that is a specialized type of grease that uh, has very good resistance against high pressure this one here uh, did spill a bit so we're gonna remove that using some uh, Swiss play-doh called the Rodico I think Rodico is actually cheaper than the play-doh anyway finished on the dial side we're gonna put in uh, the lever the pallet fork that one goes uh, back and forth together with the balance wheel and uh, thus releases the power from the train with the small increments every time it goes left and right now the pallets in the fork is what we're oiling right here they interact with the escape wheel on the left side here and what we're doing is that we're putting a little bit of uh, lubrication on the uh, pallet uh, surface and then we're uh, distributing that over the escape wheel teeth and yeah those teeth are pretty strange looking a little bit like a boot that is all uh, designed to uh, make the watch uh, run as uh, good as possible it's called a swiss lever escapement all right let's then see if uh, the watch wants to start up we're going to put the balance in and this is the moment of truth the highlight of every uh, watchmaker's life oh okay give it a little bit of a help just to make the pivots fall into place and then the watch starts up always nice to see with the watch running we're gonna oil the rest of uh, the jewels the bearings again this is of course to minimize uh, friction then we can give the watch a little bit more of a wind and then uh, put it on uh, the time grapher well actually we're first going to demagnetize the movement there are a lot of sources of magnetism around us nowadays so uh, it's always a good thing to demagnetize the movement if the watch is magnetized it uh, might run slow or fast but it will not run well this watch however runs pretty well 
really uh, impressed actually by uh, the performance. Just gonna adjust it a little bit so that it doesn't go as fast. Typically three to five seconds fast per day is optimal. And uh, yeah, very happy with this. We can then put on the hour wheel, which is a wheel that will hold our hand. And then let's look at the dial. Now, dials are extremely fragile. So there isn't really too much that can be done about it. We are going to try to take out uh, any uh, surface uh, dirt. But pretty much all the spots, all the blemishes on this dial, uh, taking them out by cleaning would be akin to uh, saying to someone with freckles to uh, wash out their freckles. That's simply not how it works. The choices are to basically leave it as it is or have it repainted. And it's still a beautiful dial, so there's no way we're going to repaint it. So we're replacing those old uh, psycho-looking hands with uh, old Aretta-looking hands, I suppose. Yeah, there. Then we can put on the minute hand. And with a minute hand on, uh, the only thing we need to do now is to case the watch. But the case was pretty worn, so we're gonna make it a little bit uh, fresher. The sides of the case are uh, flat, so we're gonna use our lapping wheel for uh, the sides. And then the rest of the case we're gonna use uh, a felt wheel to take out the worst scratches. Note that we are going to respect the shape of the case. And that shape has most likely developed a little bit over the years with some uh, polishing and uh, what have you. So we're not going to be too aggressive, but uh, we are going to make it uh, nice and shiny before we gold plate it. It does not take a lot of work to get uh, the worst scratches out. The case back on this watch is uh, rounded, there are no flats. And then we use a different tool, we use this uh, bobino. As you can see it spins uh, in the same speed as uh, the polishing wheel when we hold uh, the part up to it. And the benefit of that is that uh, we uh, don't make any flats on the rounded surface. You can imagine if we hold the round surface up to a polishing wheel for a long time, or not even more than a couple of seconds you will get a flat developing. Finally, we use uh, the mop uh, wheels to then uh, achieve the high luster. We do that on uh, all the different parts. And then we are ready to gold plate. After cleaning these parts, of course. I use this uh, gold plating setup uh, from uh, goldplating.com. Yeah, I suppose they were pretty early when the domain names were uh, given out. So the first step is to uh, clean the parts on the left side here. In the middle we have a uh, nickel strike, basically just to close the pores of uh, the brass case, before we then ultimately on the right side have uh, the gold solution. Now, the keen-eyed observer might have seen uh, the number 10 on the case between the lugs. And that is for 10 microns. So originally this case was uh, gold-plated to a 10 micron uh, thickness. For those who are not familiar with uh, what micron is, it's uh, one thousandth of a millimeter. So 10 microns is one hundredth of a millimeter. 10 micron uh, was uh, not much. Most uh, high quality watches would have 20 or maybe even 40. But achieving 10 microns uh, with a kit like this is still uh, pretty much impossible. We should still be able to give the case a little bit of renewed life. Another thing that needs new life is the crystal. 
These crystals are uh, commodities. They can be bought in uh, so-called material houses, so basically uh, spare part consumables uh, stores like uh, Cousins UK, for instance. This crystal goes into the bezel. So I'm sort of bending the crystal around this little uh, anvil, if you will. And then I can press the bezel onto the crystal from the other side. Et voila! All right, time to put everything together. Actually, I didn't have to take the crown out, did I? Oh well. The bezel has a little cutout that matches the crown opening, so we need to make sure we put it in the right place. And then it just snaps on. So I mentioned that I snagged this crown and stem from a donor movement. Obviously the crown doesn't really fit this watch. And the stem is also a little bit too long, so we're going to have to adjust that. But an original crown actually just rolled by. Well, actually Peter found it, but uh, it is original, fits the case. So we're going to take off this uh, other crown. We're going to clean up the threads a little bit. And then we we'll simply have to see how long the stem is, or how much too long it is rather. So we're putting the original crown on, and then we we'll simply have to measure. And there it's fully in. And then we're going to see how much of the stem needs to be taken off. I like to simply use uh, the screwdrivers for this because the width of the screwdrivers are from a little bit less than one millimeter up to almost two. And then I use a sharpie to mark the length of stem that I need to take off. We're gonna use a diamond slip to take off that little piece of stem. And the sound of that is just grating. Ooh, brings back fond memories of nails on the blackboard. Finally, we're making a little chamfer at the end of the stem so that the crown will uh, fit easier. And voila! Perfect length. When the length is right, then we want to make sure that the crown does not unscrew from the stem. And uh, we do that by using uh, Loctite. Loctite then makes uh, sure there's a bond between the stem and the crown. All right, with the crown in place, we just need to put uh, the case back on. There we go. A little bit shinier than the last time we saw it. Still a fingerprint man. And with a new strap on the watch, let's see if we made a difference. Before seeing the watch on the wrist, I just want to remind everyone that at vintagewatchservices.eu you can always find more than 100 beautiful vintage watches. And as a YouTube subscriber, you get a 10% discount. And there we have it. Beautiful old ultra-thin Aretta from the 1950s. Still an old watch, 
but it looks uh, hopefully a lot better. Hope Petar will be happy. And I hope you as a viewer also enjoyed this video. If you did, then uh, subscribe so you can uh, get notified of uh, other videos. We'll be back shortly. Until then, ta-ta. <laughs>